Coming up on this week's episode, I recap my trips to Louisville and Nashville, uh, and I also will bring on my awesome girlfriend, Kaylee, who is also a therapist, to uh, to talk some mental health stuff, and uh, specifically OCD. We do an OCD deep dive. Uh, I know I go through a lot of OCD stuff. I'm sure you guys do too. And uh, before we jump into that, I'm going to do tour dates really quickly. Um, I'm going to be in Pittsburgh, uh, August 9th at the Pittsburgh Improv. In Cleveland, I'll be in Hilarities, August 10th, the next night on a Thursday. And then in Irvine, California, I'll be at the Irvine Improv, August 17th. And then Orlando, Florida, at the Orlando Improv, August 30th. Uh, And then I go right back to Florida in September uh, for a weekend in Tampa at Side Splitters, September 7th through the 9th. Um, Get tickets there. I will see you there. And I will see you when the episode starts right now. So here we are. We're back. Second episode. Uh, thanks for tuning into the first one. You know, uh, to be honest, when I'm recording this, the first one isn't even out yet. So hope, hopefully you watched it. Fingers crossed that you liked it and you watched it. Um, but regardless of if you did, you did or you didn't, I'm back. We're back. Um, just had a uh, coming off a great trip, man. I was in. I did two different clubs. I did Louisville Comedy Club in Zanies, Nashville, and. Um, those are some big ones for me, man. Um, mostly because that, those are some of the first ones my uh, the kind of the whole agent thing that I talked about in the last episode. This was the first clubs that my my new agent got me, um, which was very exciting for me. And I remember when I first signed with the agency, I was like, I wanted uh, I gave her like four. Well, soon to also either be four or five clubs that I like really wanted to do. One of them was Zany's Nashville. Um, the other ones actually were, um, I'll just say them anyways, they were uh, the Tempe Improv, Hilarities in Cleveland, and uh, Laugh Boston. Those are the clubs I, I like specifically wanted to really do, and she got me all of those. Um, but Zany's Nashville was the first ones she uh, actually got me. So it was, a, uh, it was a big deal. I mean, that club is very like iconic, so it's a pretty big deal. So, um, so I was very excited, and... I did. I was doing one of those uh, one of those one nighters, which is the thing where um, you basically just go in and do one show, and then you're out of there. It's normally on like a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday. So my Nashville show was on a Wednesday, right? Which is a bit of a hard day to sell. If you go out on a Wednesday, you gotta really like the person. You can't. You don't really go out on a Wednesday just to go out, unless you're in college. Maybe I don't really know to be honest. But the way that a lot of these one nighters work is that. Uh, they like to pair you with a different city that's close. Uh, it's called routing. So to essentially to fly all the way to that part of the country uh, to make it more worth your while, you do another club nearby uh, just to make the travel, you know, cost more co- cost effective for the travel. You know, I talked about the tour dates at the beginning. I'm doing Pittsburgh and Cleveland back to back nights. That's because they're very close. So it makes sense. Knock out two markets in one trip, basically. And so what happened with Nashville is she was like, all right, I got you Nashville. And I also got you Louisville. And I was like, okay, Uh, yeah, Louisville, sure, okay. Yeah, man, that'll be good, I think. Uh, The reason for my reaction is because, like I talked about in the first episode, I have this very extensive email list where I know exactly where my people are. You know, I knew I knew I had like uh, emails in Nashville. I mean, it was over a hundred emails I had in Nashville. So I was like, okay, that's just one, another city I could definitely hit. And Louisville, I had maybe, I mean, between Louisville and like Lexington, those are two main Kentucky cities. I mean, maybe like uh, 15, 20, not a lot. So once you gave me Louisville, I was like, I'll do it, obviously. Um, but I was like, okay, I don't like. I was already like, I've I may sell eight tickets there. So as long as we both are on the same page, <laughs> I'll go to Kentucky. So, so it, you know, leading up to it, ticket sales were like, were about what I thought, you know, it was like, you know, like 30 tickets for a while. And, uh, and so I was kind of like, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I made it very clear. Like we all know Louisville is not a big place for me, right? Like really, let's make this very clear that I don't think I can sell many tickets there. Do we all know this? We're all on the same page. Great. Let's go to Kentucky. Am I flying spirit? You're goddamn right. I am. <laughs> um, and I mean, the whole year basically is like a is like a test to essentially see where I can like sell tickets. You know, I think I've proven that people will come see me. But now it's like great. Now let's see really where you can you know where some good markets are for you, where some not as good places like Kentucky. Who knows? It's a good test. You know, and 
first episode, I recap my trip to uh, Royal Oak, Michigan. And I had, I've done this one other time this year. It's the craziest travel turnaround I could possibly do. And it's arguably um, dumb as shit, for lack of a better term. So this is my this is my travel schedule, okay? So I get back. So I'm in Royal Oak, Michigan from Wednesday to Sunday. I have a flight back from to LA on Sunday. I get back to LA at like 5 p.m., land at LAX, and my flight to Louisville is Monday at 8 a.m. So I'm home in LA. Like by the time I get home, like 7, 7 to midnight, and I got to get up at 5, 6, to catch a flight to Louisville, like the back to the fucking Midwest, East, what, East, Mid, Mid East. I don't know what it is. It should be the Mid East. Middle East is not what it is, but it's not the Midwest. I don't think that part of our country is going to really flow with Middle East term too well. <laughs> hey, man, hey, we're not trying to make this heated, dude. This is a political podcast, all right, Mike? But, but that's not, dude, they say Chicago. You're from Chicago, right, Mike? Or yeah, it Illinois? doesn't feel like it should be Midwest when you How look is at that the, the country. Midwest? But, hey, that's what they told me when I was born. That's the first thing I told you when you were born? <laughs> first words I heard was Midwest, <laughs> bears, right. midway. That's it. All right. Cut the umbilical cord. <laughs> but, I mean, just, I mean, middle Midwest is Denver. Midwest is Denver and, like, Oklahoma, maybe. That was a weird jump all the way to there. But, I'm, dude, I'm like, Kentucky is so east. Actually, wait. Maybe Louisville's not even – they don't even say that in the Midwest. Michigan, that's why I said that was the Midwest. That's where I got. I was like, how did I even get – now I'm confusing myself. they're just myself. the north. Why would they call themselves the Midwest? It's north. Dude, you're right, man. It's just – it's north. I don't know. That's just my – those are my – those are my – that's my hot geography take. Um, So – yeah, the, the 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 turnaround time was insane. It was it was what I call a, a high buy. Actually, my, my dad coined that term. It's a high buy. Uh, I come home, see my girlfriend, you know, hi, bye, we're back out. Got to do a high buy. If I were single, maybe it would be different because I don't have anywhere anyone to come home to. Sad, but I have her, so you want to high buy it, you know. And I don't mind the travel. You know, a lot of us just you just sit there. I don't have to do much. You know, you get you get in the seat and you sit there, and it's four hours later, and then you're in Kentucky, and it's too goddamn hot. Okay, that's what it is. I tell you what, man, doing all this travel has really made me realize um, how much I love L.A. weather. I mean, this is such a corny, basic conversation topic. But, man, everywhere you go is just, like, so hot or raining out of nowhere, humid. It's like – and Louisville was the same thing. It's like I was in – Atlanta was insane weather. Louisville, it was, like, so hot, so humid. And there was a a thunderstorm that was, like – I mean, bro, terrifying. The the you can see bolts of lightning shooting out of the sky to a point where you're like, is, is this the Avengers? Why are these so intense? It was kind of crazy to see that. And again, the Avengers probably is a bad reference, but I don't watch the Marvel movies, so you can put all your hate for that in the comments. Um, what's really upsetting is it's still hot when there's a thunderstorm. That's just like, yeah, that's too much. It can't be hot and like cool rain. Okay, right. But. Uh-huh. Hot. I want hot rain. Speaking of hot rain, dude. The, and the, get this. So it was too hot. The rain was hot. There's bolts of lightning shoot out of the sky. I'm sweating. Everywhere's sweating. I'm wet. And we get back. We're staying at me and my buddy Anthony, who's with me, who's opening. We are staying at an Airbnb in Louisville. And um, and there the there is there's no uh cold water in the shower. And it's not just like ooh, it's a little warm, dude. The shower's like scalding hot, like uh, arguably unsafe. So we're like sweating, humid, humid, hot. All you want to do is take a cold shower. And the Airbnb has no cold water. It was so hot that I had to angle the the shower head like away so it's hitting the wall. And I had to kind of like cup, like spray myself with water to hopefully it'll cool off by the time it'll hit my face in the brief second I'm splashing it on myself. It was that hot. (laughs) It, It was like. How do you take it? It was one of the most difficult showers I've ever taken. And the Airbnb was like, oh, we can send maintenance to fix it. Take a video of the thing. No. I'm not going to take a video of the thing. Fix it before I get there. Take a video. No, I'm not doing your homework. How do you show hot water in a video, too, coming out of the shower? Oh, I have this infrared thing on my camera. No, I don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. I have no – they won't be like, how are you turning it on or something? It was like, how are you – we want to show the – see the maintenance people how you're doing it. I'm like, bro, I'm turning the shower on. What do you mean how I'm doing it? You think I'm just 
there's because it, it's one it's like a cold to hot circle thing and it's i mean dude i've spun it every which way it was like i was trying to solve a rubik's cube like you think i didn't as if i've like just oh i was doing it wrong like you don't think i tried everything airbnb i tried everything make it work before i get there don't make me like okay the maintenance will be there from two to five hey i got a show to do for 30 people okay i'm a busy guy <laughs> um but weather aside louisville was a cool little town um i liked it it um i don't know how else to describe it it was like a nice little downtown area people were super nice i think maybe that like southern hospitality type of vibe um yeah it was just really it was it was a nice place that's all I got to really say about it. And I forgot also, um, on the second shower I took, I accidentally brought um, what I thought was body wash, and it turned out to be shampoo that was that had, like, it's this Dove shampoo that has, like, caffeine in it. It's, like, caffeine, Dove, uh, um, what's that, like, you know, like, Vicks Vapor Rub, that shit, that, like. Menthol? Menthol, thank you. Caffeine and menthol. Yeah, Mike's pulling up a picture of it right now. It, dude, it's a shampoo that's like has caffeine in it. I don't want caffeine in my shampoo. I'll drink a little bit of coffee. I don't want to put shit in my hair to make me. Ca- I'm not like in the shower, like, <laughs> yeah, man, it's so hot, feels good. Is that it right there? Yeah, dude, this is like shampoo and conditioner, caffeine plus menthol. Look at this two in one shampoo. This is what I brought accidentally. Caffeine and menthol shampoo and do the menthol stuff. I was and I used this because I had no body wash. Did the Airbnb have body wash? No, of course the pumps were empty. Of course. Why would they be why would there be soap for us to use? And so I used that as body wash, and now I'm rubbing this like menthol stuff all over my body. My penis is tingling, my asshole's tingling. I'm wired from the caffeine. I have third degree burns from the shampoo. And now I gotta go do the show. So that's the pre-show Louisville experience. And um, I got to be honest, with all this set being said about um, about me, you know, being worried about not being able to sell tickets in Louisville, blah, 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 ended up selling, I think, 52 tickets. And to me, obviously, that's a little lower than what I would like. But the club was like, dude, it's a it's a Tuesday. For Tuesday shows, there's normally like 12 people here. So I ended up feeling pretty good about that. Um, and I think also what I want this podcast to be is like, it's so easy for comedians to be like, Louisville show packed out on a Tuesday. Show is sick. Low ticket warning, everyone. Low ticket warning. <laughs> exactly. But I'm I'm not doing that shit here. I'm keeping it very real with you guys. And I'm telling you, yes, I sold 52 tickets. I don't need to. I'm not going to bullshit you guys ever. That's how many I sold. And, I, and it's, for me, that was good in a market that I was not planning on going to on a Tuesday with bolts of lightning shooting out of the sky. And who knows if there's any cold water in Louisville. Unconfirmed. That may be just a thing you guys deal with. Um, and dude, the show was like so fun. It was so much fun. Like one of my favorite shows of the tour. Just 50 of like the coolest, nicest people who are like my fans. Because like I said before, if you go out on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, you go to see the person. And so I had this group of people who were just so down, so excited. They were just like, I had so much fun. I remember I did... Uh, I did 55 minutes. That was how long my set was. And I was like, I could have stayed up there for another 30 minutes. I mean, they were so fun. Except for uh, one older lady off to the side. She was with her daughter who was very young and the husband. And this woman was like talking a lot during the show. And which is fine. And, and you know, you can you always will give them a few chances to be like, hey, do you mind keeping it down? And after like the first one, I, I honestly was like, hey, have you, uh, hey, I have a question. This is during my set. I was like, have you been to a, a comedy show before? And she said, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. Um, well, you know you're like not – like you shouldn't really talk, right? She's like, oh, yeah, but I'm I'm older than you. Just keep keep going. Like doing this type of – like you – this almost like I'm – I'm just because I'm older, I know better than you type of thing. And I was – I mean it was – when she did this, I was like, oh, oh, oh man. It was like I had to just take the anger and just push it back into my my body, you know, because there's also 48 other people who are happy to see me. And so I was when she did this shit like I'm older. I I get it. You don't understand. It's like just because you're older doesn't mean you're like smarter or doesn't mean you, you know how to handle yourself in social situations like she had no she was so clueless. I've run into that a few times with kind of with people like that who were just like 
No, I know what I'm doing. You continue. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I will. I mean, I, I wasn't going to kick her out because it's like, which also, well, we'll all get into that later. I want to do a whole, re I want to do a whole recap of the whole shoe tying debacle that I went to. My sister named it Shoegate, um, where a woman, well, I'm sure you, if you know me, you know this, but when a, a woman came up uh, and tried to tie my shoes in the middle of the show and it turned into a whole thing and I posted the clip and it's the most hate I've ever gotten on the internet in my entire life. <laughs> I want to do a whole separate uh, podcast about that. So that we'll talk about later. So in terms of kicking women out of shows, um, I'm going to stay away from doing that for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> even if she was very entitled, but you know, it was, it was, it was what it was. It's, it's just a, it's all part of it. And, um, and I will say, man, shout out to Louisville comedy club. That is one of the most well-run comedy clubs I've ever seen. The staff was on fire. They were so cool. They were treating it like there was 300 people in that room, you know? And if I was any other comic, it would have seemed like there was. But I'm keeping it real with you guys. <laughs> that club was perfect, though, man. It was 300 seats. The seats were all, like, how they should be. What I mean is that, like, they were all facing this way. 300 seats all facing this way, low ceiling. Sometimes you'll go to a club. A lot of improvs are like this. And improvs are great clubs. But where they'll they'll have, like, side – they'll have, like, side – seats like this and you'll have to like turn to the to the stage where it's like you're with your party but then the comics here so you got to just do this weird like you got to pivot your chair but all these seats were straight on and that's really how it should be you know almost like you're watching a movie um yeah i can't wait to be back to that club i really hope i am because that was a, it was a really fun time and um and did i did i dm jack harlow because he's from louisville yeah uh did he respond no. Will I try again next time I'm there? Probably. So that was Louisville. And from Louisville, went to uh, went to Nashville. And uh, those places are very, uh, they're very close. But um, you can't get there easily. I'll tell you what, man. You could, there's, It's like a three-hour drive. You cannot get a direct flight there for some reason. And to rent a car, because you do like the one-way car rental thing, that's like uh, $400. So I, I did a new thing where it took a um, took a, a Greyhound bus there, about two and a half hour drive. Um, left nice and early because I was like, I, I think Greyhound bus they may have a bit of a bit of a bad rap because I was like I don't, I was like well this isn't gonna go perfectly smooth, something's gonna get messed up right. This is just not gonna go perfectly smooth. So we took an early bus to get there at like two three. Show was at seven, so had some nice cushion. Um, uh, we left an hour late because something's got to go wrong, right? And that's what went wrong. Left an hour late because the guy was just figuring out. He let us know on the way out. He was like, yeah, something something was wrong with the bus. So we just had to make sure. Kind of, I'm fine or anything. I was like, okay, well, hope hope you figured it out, man. <laughs> just please us cast to Tennessee. Bus ride was fine. I'm going to start utilizing the bus. Bus is more. Really easy, dude, to just look out the window and chill. No turbulence. No, tr no, no like, rental car debacle you know with your license or anything like that it was just an easy it was an easy trip and um and so yeah like i said at the beginning man zany's nashville that's like an iconic comedy club that's like a big probably one of the more famous comedy clubs in the game i'd say and so when i got the opportunity to do it i was definitely like that was one of the main clubs that i wanted to do like really well at um, just because it's such a big deal, you know, and that was especially because I was like, I want to do that club. So if you if you're like, I want to do that place, and then you fucking sell 34 tickets, it's like, hey guy, what? Why did you say you? What are you doing? You wanted to be here, you know. So I felt a little bit of pressure just because of the weight of how prestigious the club is. And I gotta be honest, man, tickets are moving like pretty slow, and I was getting a little like a little nervous. And compared to other cities, I knew the email list wasn't as big, so I was like, all right, well. Uh, it makes sense that I'm not selling like New York numbers, you know, or Chicago numbers, but the tickets were at like 90 tickets for like weeks. And I was like, am I really just going to sell 90 here? Like that's, that's low. The club seats like 290. I was like, this is going to be embarrassing if I sell 90 tickets, you know, and it's on a Wednesday. So I was like, oh, I don't know. And so, uh, what's cool about Zanies is they, they've, um, they have a condo that they put you up at like a block from the club. They have this like beautiful, like two story, uh, two bedroom condo. It's like a townhouse. It's so close to the club that you can out the bedroom window. You can you can through the blinds see the club. You can see the marquee um, from the club, which is really, which is really cool. If 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 I was like you know some 
crazy sellout guy. You can literally see the line of people as you're just showered naked, peering through the window. Creepy. <laughs> um, but uh, we uh, so we got there and uh, and I, I and you know Monday they told me the tickets were at like 140 or something like that, and I was like, okay, cool. Like that's that's if this hits 150, I'll be like pumped. You know, still I, I room for improvement. You know, but to me on a Wednesday, still my first tour 150, I'll be like, I'll be happy about that. So we get to we get to Zany's and um and uh and I show up and we're at um we're at they told me we're at 206 and I was like I had to contain some of my excitement cuz you can't be like yes I did it yes man I didn't think I didn't think I could I was like yeah cool that sounds keep the game face exactly yeah I was like yeah that's that's what I expected to do and that's what I always do everywhere how did Louisville go? Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was, I was like so pumped uh, for for that many tickets. It was just, it was, it was like the most excited I've been for a show, like pre-show. I was in the green room, like stoked. The fact that I got over two hundred people here on a Wednesday in this town where there's a bunch of things to do, I was stoked. I really was, and and the crowd was like, the crowd was awesome. That club is great, and the people were stoked, man. They were like so excited. They were just like ready. Yeah, I like felt the energy in the room. So the crowd was like, they were just so pumped to be there. It made me feel really, really great. And um, but what's what's interesting and cool about this business is is um, or not cool really. What's interesting is that like I was also like off that night. I didn't like love my set. Um, and that's something where, you know, you can't really tell. Like to everybody who was there <clears throat> and after, everyone was so complimentary and so cool. The meet and greet was amazing. You guys came out and bought merch. And it was like the coolest group of people I've seen. One of the coolest groups of people I've seen so far. But what's just so interesting is that I really was like, the right when I got off, I was like, ah, that wasn't really it for me. Like I, I just, I was just, it's just so hard to have like a perfect show every time. And for a long time, I always expected that I expect to go out and have like a, at least a nine out of 10 every night. And it's just not possible, especially with all the travel and stuff. I didn't sleep great the night before. And I just felt like I wasn't that sharp. The show was great. And since then I've looked at the footage and the footage is great and people had a great time and the set went great, but it was my little, my, my little, my little brain, my, my, my little kind of like neuroses about how the show should be. I was just, it was nitpicking little moments that I was like, ah, ah, like these, these little things. So I wasn't like super pumped about how I did, um, which I think you guys can understand. That's just how it is as a comedian. Um, and again, I want to keep it real with you guys. Again, it's very easy for me to come on and be like, crushed it, crowd is great, applause breaks, blah, blah, blah. And look, show is great, but your boy was off. That's just what it is. And it's just, I'm, I'm learning to accept that. You're going to have an off night, no matter what you do, no matter what business you're in, you're going to be a little off. And I'm I'm human, and I'm okay to admit that. But again, show rocked, crowd was awesome. You know, no one would be able to tell. <laughs> it was one of those things. So, um, yeah, we uh, we um, for the first time in a while, I actually went out, went out and hit the town. After me and my buddy Anthony, do we went out on we went out on Broadway, which is like the almost like the Las Vegas Strip of Nashville, like neon lights out of outside of every bar, just all these like country bars. It was almost like I've never been in New Orleans, but it was very much felt like a, like a mini New Orleans. People were drinking, there was music, and I mean every bar had live music, which I didn't know. It was. It was. It wasn't like, oh, let's go to the one bar to see live music. It was every single bar had like a dope band playing songs that you love. It was. I was very impressed with Nashville. I, I get why people love going out there. It was awesome. Um, it almost. It, it, there was so much music and the music was so good that it, it made me. I was like, because I'd started drinking at that point, so I was like, all right. Let's find some karaoke. <laughs> it was that like it's not the city you want to do karaoke in. <laughs> so, oh, one hundred percent. With these like amazing musicians and me, hey, freaking wagon wheel. Let's go. Um, it, it really, it really like inspired you. I was like, I want to do that too, because there is a sense. I think, I think it's there's a there's a cliche where I feel like every comedian wants to also be like a rock star, and 
dude, I relate to that 100%. Playing live music is such a dope thing. And um, and so I tried to find, I was, I really wanted to like, let's find some karaoke, but it didn't exist, but I was ready. I would have, I'd be like, and for me, if, if I'll do karaoke, I've only done it a few times, but I have to be fairly drunk, if not a heavy buzz. I don't drink a lot, but I have to have a nice buzz going. And just, you got to put on like Mr. Brightside or something. And I'm going to sing hard. Is it going to be as good as the country singers at the bars? No, but I was, I was inspired. I was ready to be a musician that night. Give me a cowboy hat. I was, I was in, I had a great time. Did I drink too much? Yeah, I drank a little too much. I got to be honest. It was, uh, I was trying, I was, I was Anthony, my buddy, he can drink and I was keeping up. I was like, I can do this. I'm a Nashville guy. How much, how many beer, how many beers can I drink? Fucking watch dude. <laughs> and, and it was, it was uh, the next day was a little rough. A little rough. It was one of those uh, one of those nights before I went to sleep where he had like a six a.m. flight, so he was gonna stay up until like four a.m. to to just like you know go right to the airport. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna stay up with you too. And I mean, I lasted forty five minutes with him. I was like, I got the one alcohol feeling where you you start to get a little nauseous, and you're like, all right, that's my cue. I'm, I'm out of here. Good night. And that was my that was my cue. And I didn't I wasn't, you know, I didn't drink that much, but it was enough to be like, okay, good night. Um so that was Nashville, dude. Overall, big trip. Pumped about the results. Again, wanted to keep it real with you guys um for for how uh how these shows go, you know? And um so just thanks for all the people that came out to Louisville and Nashville. Coolest people, greatest crowds. I had such a fun time. And, uh, and I can't wait to be back, man. I know uh, the clubs were happy. So if the clubs are happy, I'm happy. And uh, so, yeah, again, people who came out, thank you so much for coming out. And um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, I'll be sitting next to my girlfriend, Kaylee. So we'll be right back. Hey, everyone. Coming at you from my apartment because I forgot to tell you on the episode uh, to submit your life advice questions for next week's episode. Um, the segment is going to be called Second Opinion. Basically, anything you need a second opinion about, whether it be life, relationships, work, anything, hit us up. At Will Be Podcast is the Instagram page, uh, and you can submit your questions via DM there. We're going to do that instead of email for now, just to keep everything kind of, you know, more streamlined, easier to find. So again, DM the Instagram page. Uh, I'll be there for the segment, as well as potentially a guest. Could be Kaylee, could be a comedian, who knows? But, um, but send us your questions at will be podcast in the dms and let's get back to the episode all right we're back we have a very special guest on the show uh soon to be recurring guest honestly it is my beautiful talented smart amazing girlfriend kaylee there she is we gotta say something can you oh i thought maybe we could put like a little applause like yeah well, like we don't have little... sound. We don't have a oh, sound board yet. No, we just started. Can we edit well, we one could. in there? Like we could. Can we edit like a big cheer? Like yay! I mean, you're already making demands. You just got here. She called me out because I do have a soundboard too. Hi, I'm like, she just she just said you guys have the stuff. Why don't you make it happen? All right. and... Maybe he could cheer. Yeah, we'll just cheer. a couple claps in the back. He's good. Hey, everyone, action. <laughs> um, hi, baby. Hi. You can say hi to the people if you want. Hi, um, people. Uh party people hi will i'm here I'm you're here you. um i'm very happy you're here thank you for thank you for being on here uh the reason i wanted to have kaylee on so much not only is not only because she's you know my person and my my lady and my girlfriend my partner you know all that all that sexy shit uh, but also she happens to be a therapist a for real therapist not uh, not licensed yet but soon to be licensed therapist um and she's just a lot of cool things to cool things to talk about and yeah, I just want to, I want, what I want to do with Kaylee segments every week is I want to, uh, I don't know where to look. If I should look here, here, I'm going to look here for now as I'm discussing what the segment should be. We're still figuring out the two person, such two person dynamic. Um, so what I want to do is have her on and she's going to bring uh, like a topic with her, essentially like a, something, something mental health related that we can talk about. And, um, and hopefully people can learn from it because I think you, I've learned a ton from you about the mental health space through your therapizing. And I think a lot of other people could too. And they can hear a lot of interesting tools um, and mindset things from you. And uh, yeah, that's just kind of, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. How's that sound? Sounds, sounds good to me. And for the first one, I think this is a perfect way to start is um, I want to start 
by doing uh, talking about OCD. And the reason I want to talk about OCD, which is OCD is what exactly? Obsessive compulsive disorder. Thank you so much. The reason I want to talk about that is because, I mean, I I think it's a very common, uh, well, it's not an ailment, right? What's like, what would you call it? Mental health disorder. Mental health disorder. Okay. It's a disorder? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> it's recognized by the DSM-5. Well, if it's in the DSM-5s. And for those of you who don't know, the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, the fifth edition, which is basically the Bible that clinicians use to diagnose mental health disorders. Yeah. And so it is in there, which means it's an actual disorder thing. Right. 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 And I wanted to have this be the first one because I, I have a lot of OCD tendencies, I want to call them. Uh, I have a lot of OCD stuff. And um, and I know you have a few too. You ain't you ain't perfect. Um, <laughs> even though you look you look perfect. You just got your hair hair did. By the way, I want to shout that out. You just came from getting your hair done. Looks beautiful. A little too good. I you, gotta leave you in the studio. Can't let you go outside. <laughs> um. So so again. So on, in a clinical way, talk to us about just like what what exactly OCD is and why it i don't know why it exists like in our brains okay well that's a loaded question well maybe the I, maybe just the first part yeah i want to start by saying that i'm a no by no means an expert right on ocd um and also when we talk about these things i want to make sure that we are speaking about these things in a very compassionate mindful way um and i think today when you asked me to do ocd we we want to separate this from obsessive compulsive personality disorder so that's a completely separate thing that we are not talking about today today okay. we're just talking about ocd so i actually did bring my dsm-5 my Prepared. diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders <laughs> um, so i'm just going to go ahead and read the diagnostic criteria for having obsessive compulsive disorder sure so um, it'd be really funny if it was if it was like 18 pages and i didn't know that <laughs> if you were just firing through these pages like yeah okay i think um, i got it Okay, so basic criteria, um, obsessive compulsive disorder is characterized by the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. And so obsessions are defined as recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or images that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive and unwanted, oftentimes distressing, um, and they cause marked anxiety or distress. Um, also the individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts, urges, or images, or to neutralize them in, uh, with some other thought or action. Um, so obsessions are all part of the thoughts. These are the thoughts that guide the compulsions, which the compulsions are the repetitive behaviors, such as hand washing, ordering, checking, or even mental acts like praying, counting, repeating words silently that the individual feels driven to perform in response to the obsession. So, for example, if the obsessive thought says, uh, if, if you don't wash your hands, then, or if you touch that doorknob, you're going to get contaminated. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you get contaminated and you go home and touch your wife, your wife's going to get contaminated and die. And so the compulsion would be, well, I'm going to wash my hands every time I touch whatever this thing is. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Makes total sense. Um, so there should be the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. Um, one of the key factors, because like you said, you have obsessive compulsive tendencies, but a lot yeah. and, um, obsessive compulsive disorder is super common, by the way, um, especially having certain tendencies of OCD. So we all kind of like experience certain obsessions and compulsions at times, but you have to have all of the diagnostic criteria in what I'm reading now okay. to qualify for OCD, if that makes sense. So you have to have both of those things that I just yep. described. Yep, got them. Also, em. Next. the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming. So they take more than one hour a day. Huh. Or they cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. And so they're causing or, some kind of... Like either or, meaning. Or do um, you have to have both of those Yes, things? yes. 
Um, so they either need to take more than an hour. Yes. So it's like you're checking for more than an hour a day. Total of all um, the checkings and yes, illuminating. Yes. Okay. Um, or clinically significant distress. And that kind of would be up to uh, your clinician, your therapist, your psychiatrist, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, also, the obsessive compulsive symptoms are not attributable to um, any kind of substance. So it's not because you're um, abusing a drug or a medication and also isn't due to any other medical condition that may explain. Um, and it's not better explained by the symptoms of another mental disorder. So like excessive worries, uh, like in general anxiety disorder or preoccupation with appearance, like in body dysmorphic disorder so it has to be separate than you having the presence of any of those other conditions Got it. how many do you know how many people have like ocd is that say in the book or should we look it up i i think andrew huberman last year said that it's like 2.5 or 3 percent of the population but the thing about ocd is that it's so underdiagnosed because there's so much shame attached to okay. the obsessions or the compulsions because a lot of time when we think about OCD we think about the typical like checking or order or contamination but we don't think about the other realms of obsessions that aren't as talked about like that are more taboo there's like sexual obsessions there's religious obsessions there's obsessions about harm like did I did I kill someone on my way home today I need to go re mm. go do my whole route to go check if I didn't run someone over, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And these things aren't typically disclosed. So a lot of times OCD goes underdiagnosed. Well, it looks like the, so apparently, apparently it's 1% of the global population. Um, this may seem like a small number, but it actually is 70 million individual worldwide. That's a lot of people. I've diagnosed with OCD at some point in their lives. It's mm -hmm. a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Um, now, well, here's I have the first question on what you said. Let's say so for the person who their OCD thing is, oh, I, 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 I killed someone on my way home. I got to go back and check. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they have known that they didn't? Because wouldn't you be like, G -g 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 -g. and then be like, <laughs> well, I should probably go back and check. You you would think, um, but part it's, it's like you can't like ration with like an obsession. And that's kind of what you do in therapy, like through the CBT is kind of like. What's the CBT? Well, it's because here's the thing. Yeah. When you have an obsession, your anxiety about that obsession is so high. There's so much distress that that's why you do the compulsion. And so normally people just do the compulsion to get that temporary relief of the anxiety. But during that process, they don't have a lot of time to actually go like back and be like, well, why did I think that way? Right. And like, oh, well, maybe, maybe I, maybe I, this was all wrong all along. It's not, it's, it's a lot easier to just say, I did the compulsion and now I feel better. So every time I do this, I'm going to just do the compulsion. I saw a Ted talk of a woman talking about her daughter and she had that obsession of like, like, what if I ran someone over on my way home? And to her, it was like whenever she hit just like a normal pothole in the road, she thought it was a person. A really small person. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Or Mario. <laughs> okay. Well, if you almost hit Mario, go back and check because we need him. <laughs> you see Luigi in the street. No. <laughs> Not Mario. The pothole could have been one of those sewer covers coming up from a plumber. I mean, it's <laughs> also plausible. true. Yeah, he's like, finally right. the day is done. Exactly. And then, and just it's just that like that. What if that you know? What if I didn't? Your what if I did go hit someone and I don't remember? I need to go back and check. Which, if you don't remember the most <laughs> traumatic experience of your entire life, for sure, get it together. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I think you said something. You said a word that's a very important word that I think is uncertainty. And mm -hmm. I have a lot of OCD tendencies with a lot of different things. And I've realized through my own therapy, my individual therapy, um, is that um, they mostly all stem from uncertainty. That's basically what it is. And like my main my main OCD thing. And if you know me, you know this is like handshaking. Is shaking someone's hand because um, to me. Like everything we do is what everything we touch and do is with our hands. You know, everything we, whether we are going to the bathroom, wiping our butts, touching a doorknob, you know, um, it's like everything, like our hands are one of the most contaminated parts of our bodies, you know, other than like our mouths, right? And so when I shake someone's hand, all of the stuff that they've been doing, 
who knows what they've been doing with this hand. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then they shake your hand, and mm-hmm. now whatever's on their hand is now on my hand. Mm-hmm. And that's what freaks me out. It's the uncertainty of what's on this person's hand that's now on my hand, right? Mm-hmm. And so to prevent that, I'll do a lot of, hey, fist bump, hey, or finger mm-hmm. guns. Maybe I'll do some finger guns, you know? Um, mm-hmm. Or if I do happen to shake someone's hand, I'll, I'll, I'll feel like I have to immediately wash my hands, like within, like, and then it goes so deep where if I touch, then I, because if I touch my phone with the same hand I shook someone's hand with, now my phone is dirty. Mm-hmm. So it's this whole never ending. And I don't know if this is like an extreme version of that or this is more common. Um, I guess we'll find out from more people who are listening to this or watching this. But, and, but again, it comes down to uncertainty. You're just like, oh, I don't know what's on that person's hand. Mm-hmm. Now it's on mine. I better wash my hands right away. So now I know there's nothing on there, mm-hmm. right? Um, so does that, that that's very in line with, I mean, contamination I feel like is a big OCD. Right. And, and I think, like, when we think about, like, your example, like, this would probably fall maybe on, like, the kind of lower end when it comes to severities. And yeah. when we think about, like, really severe OCD, what that would look like is, like, hand washing so much throughout the day to the point where your hands are, like, chafing because yeah. of how much soap you're using, how much you're drying your hands. You're taking a lot of time to really scrub your hands all throughout the day. And like, you're, and you're you not a even... doctor. You're not a doctor, right? No, not, not you, your not regular you, person. But I'm saying I'm also not a you're doctor. You're also not a doctor. Neither am I. <laughs> two, two, two people, no doctors. Mike, not a doctor. Also, but I'm saying scrubbing like a sur- like you're not like if going to surgery, right? Scrub away. But if you're just a guy who almost ran over Mario, don't do that. You don't have to scrub your hands that much, you know. Um, which I've also heard if you wash your hands like a like the more you wash them, sometimes the worse it can be for your like skin or for whatever. What's the yeah. Dry, dries out your hands. Dries out your hands. And it also is like, it, it makes, well, th- then you can go to a whole thing about your immune system and how it's like, y- with like for me, because I'm I'm not putting enough germs into my body, I'll probably get sick more than like you would. Like you you have an insane immune system because you don't have the same, well, it's not like, you, you didn't do anything. You're, you're just living. You didn't, I don't know if you like did anything to make it happen. <laughs> if you're not, by the way, if you're not watching this podcast, watch it. I mean, there's so many little things you're probably missing. Um, so there's a sense of you do need to give your body some germs, but I like I don't want to. I don't want to give my body any germs. I want to just wash them off immediately, you know. Mm-hmm. Which, in if you were in therapy for that, like let's say you didn't want to have to accommodate by the fist bumping, yeah. and you want to like face this, this give me that hand, yeah, this obsession. Then part of it would be like kind of following the fear of like, okay, let's say that you're uncertain about some someone shaking your hand. You don't know what's going to be on your hands. What do you think is going to happen with whatever's on your hands? Do you think it's going to make you sick? Do you think it's going to make you die? And you're kind of exploring and like a lot of people don't even get to that point where they realize like, what is my fear actually telling me this is going to do? But the biggest part of treating OCD, and this is like first line of treatment, is the cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure and response prevention, which means basically exposing you in a gradual and repeated way to the thing that you are specifically trying to avoid or just doing the opposite of yeah. your compulsion. And that's, so it's called like exposure therapy. That's basically what that's called, right? Yes. In- yeah. And then I, I guess for people that don't know what CBT is, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. So the basic gist of it is like our thoughts, the way we think about things, the way we perceive things have the biggest impact on how we feel about things and what we do. So someone uh, waking up thinking it's going to be a great day, I'm going to get so much done today, whatever happens today, you know, I'll be able to handle whatever comes my way. They're very likely to feel hopeful, motivated. They're more likely to actually go do things, take risks. Whereas a person who wakes up thinking, today's going to suck. I'm going to hate everything today. If something goes wrong, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. They're very likely going to feel hopeless. Yeah. They're very likely maybe not going to get out of bed that day, not go try new things. So it's all about the way we think about things affects pretty much everything else, how we experience our world. So CBT is basically like helping people unpack their thoughts and kind of identify errors in the way they're thinking and try to change the way that we think about things to change the way we experience our life. So it would be basically that kind of looking at certain thinking that's maybe maintaining the OCD 
combined with this experiential part of like, well, let's see what it's like if we shake that person's hand, touch that doorknob, and then don't wash our hands. Ah. And so part of that is starting really small. Yeah. And we make a ladder. So we start really tiny. So like what would be at the bottom of your list where your anxiety is maybe like one out of 10? Maybe it's just looking at a dirty door handle. Okay. And then you do that a few times, repeat it. A lot then of looking you, at doorknobs. Then you move up. Then okay. it's like maybe I'll touch a doorknob and I won't wash my hands for a minute. Maybe then I'll touch a doorknob and I won't wash my hands for 30 minutes. Maybe I'll yeah. shake someone's yeah, hand yeah, yeah. and I won't wash my hands at all that day. And you just move all the way yep, up yep. to the point where you're teaching your brain like, oh, I can have this anxiety and not perform the compulsion and I'm still going to be okay. Right. Which is super hard to do. Yeah. That's a real... OCD is so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know I have also been uh, the whole exposure therapy. It's because it's like going from the one to the 10. But there's also ways of I mean, I think you told me stories about how people can with exposure therapy can be like get wild. Like, do you can do some wild shit? It's such an interesting uh, avenue of mental health where like if you have like a really bad germaphobe fear, like like licking like a bathroom floor or something would be like a 10 on the exposure chart or whatever the chart is, you know? And but that's if you do that and then you're okay, you'll be like, oh well, mm-hmm. what am I worried about? And I think you gave me an example of someone with like a there was like a donut in like oh my gosh, this I don't is, know if I can say his name. Well, don't say his name. We don't need to know his name. But this is a crazy mm-hmm. talk about exposure yeah. therapy. This shit's crazy to me. Well, when I when I started uh, doing working in research labs in undergrad, I was in an OCD and fear lab where we would work with clients in an outpatient treatment center who suffered from really moderate to severe OCD. And we would do exposure therapy with them and track all of their behaviors and their progress. And the the therapist that like ran the whole group was really, really committed to like helping these people see that their OCD is not like aligned with reality. Yeah. And so he'd get a lot of like kids and teenagers and a lot of them had OCD with like contamination um, obsessions. And so I've seen him, he'd take a donut and he'd give it to the kid and he'd like, let's say the kid had obsessions of like, if, you know, if I get contaminated, then I'll die. Mm-hmm. So he, give the donut to the kid and he'd say go around the office and let every person do whatever they want to this donut you do whatever you want to this donut put it in the toilet wipe it on the windowsill just Sounds do it like a frat house game <laughs> yeah it's like a hazing yeah. oh yeah you want to be a therapist give it the donut yeah, test. It's like do do anything you want and don't even tell me what you do to the donut and Crazy. i when you come back here i will eat the donut and if you come back here next week and see that I'm alive, then you know that your OCD was wrong. And so... And then I would say, nice to meet you. I will never be back here again. <laughs> and he'd do it. Do you see it? Did you actually see this happen? Or was this like a story? I've seen him do some crazy things. And he... he he really cared about his clients and his clients had great progress. He lived but to be 42. There, but there, everyone were, else. <laughs> there were somewhere like sometimes there are obsessions about like, I don't know if we should do like a warning or something, but like people um, like vomit. That's yeah. That can be like, um, like a fear, fear of, of fear yeah. Of yeah. I have some of that. Yeah, um, for or, sure. Um, and so we'd have clients where they, they had some obsessions about vomiting and um, he'd have us pass a trash can around and just oh. pretend that we're and like make it real loud and Ugh. really gross. And yeah. Um, and I don't remember what the, the obsessive thought told this client. I think it was that, that she also was going to throw up or something like that if she didn't wow. perform some compulsion, but it's really interesting work. That's super, well, I love the, the being so committed mm-hmm. to that. Like I will eat this fucking donut. Like, just to show you, like, just like, because you know, that's pretty na- gnarly. Like, he could be putting some crazy stuff in his body, but he's like, I'm willing to take that to teach you guys that, mm-hmm. like. And I'm sure he had really good immune system. Oh my god! Yeah. Oh my. God. He's like COVID. What? What's that? Don't even know what you're talking about. Had it four times, felt nothing, because of the donut. Um. Well, also, I also want to get into like specific. That's also like super great backstory. I mean, I've even I knew all about that. I still learned something from that. Um, I want to also just talk about just like even my my own like OCDs that I have, and even some of yours. And Mike, also, I'm sure you may have a couple things too, unless you're just perfect. Um, Packing. If I have to put together stuff for a production or anything like that, 
I will go back through my stuff three or four times. I will go out to the truck yard and go through everything to make sure the next day mm. that everything's there. I can't drive to set and show up and not have what I needed yeah. in front of like 40 people. Like I will unpack and repack 10 times if I have to. Mm. Wow. And and, I, but, I blame Sativa. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's, but is that a thing where you... Well, that's drug induced, so... It, it's in the well, book. I, I, don't, I won't touch Sativas because of it. I, I'm trying to diagnose myself. That's self... self Self therapy. Sure, sure. It's the only film I can afford. Well, <laughs> well, um, but do, when you're doing that though, are you like, do you know, are you or do you think like this is so stupid? What what am I doing? Because I'll have moments where I'm doing OCD stuff and I know it's dumb. Like I'll know I'm wrong, but I'm like I still have to do it because the consequences are not worth it. The con, like you, if I br- I didn't bring my charger, me checking was worth it in- instead of not actually having it. Yeah, like the the not having it is just. Yeah, forget it. Like, oh, I lost an hour of my night or something. Who cares about yep. that versus the repacking or whatever? Like, it's it's worth it ten times over to me. It's like showing up way too early. As I've got older, yeah. I show up earlier and earlier just because the stress of anything happening. It's like, nope, not worth that. Right. I will not be outside of LAX while my plane takes off ever. Yep, that's a good point. But that's also, I think, a, a huge part of this OCD thing is that you do the thing because doing the thing real quick is easier than what the potential outcome could be. Because like for me, wash. Let's go back to the hand washing thing. If I just wash my hands, that takes that takes louder coughing, Mike. Um, that takes um, thirty seconds to wash my hands. <laughs> Ow! Um, thirty seconds to wash my hands. And then like, but if but it, and then if I don't do that, I could have someone else's poopy, poopy that they wiped their butt with on my hand. Now I'd rather just wash my hands for thirty seconds to get out of the way. I could just be OCD forever. And have clean hands. Now, what do you say to all that? Here's another good example, real quick. Is the same thing. Here's a good one for me. This is a really quick one. Is I will always have to make sure, like my well, the stove is off. That's a classic, mm-hmm. classic OCD greatest mm-hmm. hits album. It, oh, stove would be number one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the album number one is the stove running. That'd be the first track. And so I'll ch- and I'm to me going back to check if the stove is off, which takes about seven seconds, is worth it rather than my apartment blowing up or something while I'm here. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Now, what do you say to that? I I say that this, I mean, it's good, good reflection of how like the different obsessions and compulsions can kind of be on like a spectrum of like depends on how you know how dire are the consequences. You'd be more likely to like perform a compulsion if it means you know the difference between life or death. Whereas right. like, for getting a charger or something, it's probably lower on the scale. But um. I think she said we're basic bitches. That's <laughs> the tone like I'm getting. It. Yeah, I well, know. Well, it's like, like as a reminder, like we we don't have OCD. We have OCD tendencies, tendencies which which I think a lot of people do to some extent. I know. But, um, and like with your with your oven example, you know, there's there's that, and like lots of people do that. Pretty mm-hmm. common to like check the oven, check and it's oven. like it's like all. All of the things that we can experience, like certain symptoms, like anxiety, depression, like obsessive compulsive, like tendencies, these are all things that are totally normal and exist like in humans. But where we need to start like looking at it in the framework of is this a problem? Is this a disorder? Is like how much it's interfering with your life? How much time it's consuming? So it's like, you know, if like maybe you check your oven once or twice and you can go on with your day and that's fine. Some people with OCD have to check like 26 times before they can even leave there. They can't even leave for an hour. My friend, I was telling you about the other day, I'm not going to say her name, but yeah, she also checks her oven and her curling iron and she will go to the lengths of taking a picture just to make sure that she actually checked. Off. Yeah, like, yeah. T- t- take a picture so that when because it gets to the point where once she gets all the way out down into the parking garage into her car, she's like, "Did I check it?" And we'll have to get yep. out, go all the way back up. So we might as well just check your phone, check the time you took the picture. And it's like, "Yep, I definitely checked yeah. just now." But and then she's got just a whole year in review of just pictures of her <laughs> oven and her phone, her oven, her curling iron. It's like selfie, selfie, really oven, this oven, oven, oven. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so, and you know, it's different for everyone. It shows up differently for everyone. Um, I mean, there's so many, like, even superstitions can be OCD stuff. Like, mm. I'll have things where if I have a certain pair of underwear and if I have a bad set, I'll be like, I can never wear those underwear again. 
or of a sh- I mean, a shirt's a better example because underwear is like almost always the same. But like, if I wore this shirt, you know what's funny? I literally have it with this shirt. I wore this shirt <laughs> to a show I had in Portland, my yeah. big headlining show in Portland, and the crowd was amazing. But I didn't like my set, and so now I'm like, and have I worn this? This was in March. I have not worn this shirt on stage since because I'm like, well, it was definitely this shirt. It wasn't wow. my own brain. How much sleep I got the luck of potential moments in standup. Um, so, then, so then to that example, what do you say to things like that? I mean, the, the easy way to, it's, it's just like, well, it's obviously not connected. That's well, just in your head. Well, it's like. But then I'll be like, oh, well, I'm not going to, if I, let's say I have a big show tonight, I'm not going to run the risk of wearing this shirt. What if it's a bad, I don't want to have a bad set tonight. So just in case, I will not wear the shirt mm. on stage ever. And is there a placebo effect to having lucky things? Like those are my right. lucky shoes. Those are my show yeah, shoes. Yeah, exactly. Or any of that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I've, oh, I've had show shoes all day. I'll be yeah. like, oh, well, I can only wear these shoes on stage. And I think that like superstition is so weird. Even in Andrew Huberman's podcast that he did on OCD specifically, he had a whole separate section just on superstition. And I, I kind of categorize superstition more in like thinking errors. Like it's more like magical thinking. But I feel like... It's interesting was when you think about certain disorders, they all kind of like are connected in a way. So it's like sometimes the presence, if you have like anxiety, you're also more likely to have like a comorbid disorder. So it's like OCD, anxiety, body focused repetitive disorders all kind of live in the same realm. So like superstition kind of falls under like certain anxiety of like, well, you know, I had this one thing confirmed for me in the past. Mm -hmm. What if this ends up happening out this way again or yep so it all kind of it's kind of all under the same umbrella i think and i I mean i think the way to get better at it is just wear the shirt and then but then what if i have another bad set and you burn the shirt then i burn the shirt never wear the shirt again so i don't know and that's like the hardest part of facing the ocd is like just facing it seeing what could happen the best is though is if is if you is if you do wear like the shirt and then you have a great set, then you get to be like, oh, great! Now well, it's now it was all in my head, like confirmed that it was all in my head. This is not a real thing. Show shoes aren't a thing. Right. Let's continue on. Right. With life. Right. But it's so hard because mm-hmm. it's like what it's to, to me. It's like okay, what to even just going back to the shirt example. What what set am I comfortable with? Maybe having a bad set. That's how my brain works. Like which, like it'll be like, oh, I'll wear this shirt tonight. Well, well, that I don't would be do part of this your one. exposure hierarchy. Yeah, it'd be like maybe, maybe I'll wear this shirt to <laughs> comedy. <laughs> I know. I'm like, which one do I throw under the bus? Which the which shitty? Which doesn't matter for oh, any, well, this any one, club. I'll wear to the. And Funny. then maybe I'll be, do that a couple sets, and then maybe I'll work my way up to what's the next shittiest club. Let's not talk about shitty clubs out here. We're definitely bleeping well, I'm, out. I'm not a comedian. Yeah, I but I am. This is my I podcast. <laughs> but really, that is my segment the of your podcast. Yeah, but still. I get what you're saying, though. I mean. Well, I think the problem, too, is like, let's say it's between, you know, that shirt or a red shirt. Well, actually, hmm. I'm trying to think of a good way to frame this. Okay. Let's say it's between that shirt or a red shirt. Okay. And... You think like, okay, don't don't wear the white shirt, don't wear the white shirt. Like right. the white shirt's gonna give me a bad show. Definitely I need to wear the side. I'm gonna wear the red, red shirt. Wear the red shirt, it's safe. So you in wearing the red shirt, yeah. And like, let's say you were gonna have a fine set anyway, so you have a fine set in the red shirt. You feel this like relief once you wear the red shirt. Yep. Because you you made this choice, but within that relief, it's not just that it gives you the relief of okay, I wore the red shirt. And maybe if I wore the white shirt, it could have worked out fine. That's not what happens. It's almost like it just reinforces that I was feeling bad and I wore the red shirt and now I feel better. And so now next time I'm going to do it, I'm going to be much more likely to wear the red shirt again. And it's like the more you keep feeding, we call it the monster, like the OCD monster. The more you keep Mm. feeding the monster, the hungrier it gets. So Mm. it just keeps reinforcing this idea of I need to wear the red shirt every time. It makes it worse and worse for you. And that's why part of it is like starving the monster yeah. of like either not giving it what it wants or doing something differently. And it's so, so, so hard because it does cause the person so much distress. So much discomfort with that. Oh my gosh. I mean, so much. Yeah, because it's, it's, 
it's that's i mean that's the whole thing is it's it like you said it's like the hardest thing to overcome because you're like it are the because in your brain will be like are the consequences worth it like mm. may as well just give the monster a snack because that's just way easier than mm. whatever the potential outcomes will be mm -hmm. um and i mean i'm also also what's what's what brings me some comfort is 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 you're not uh prone from ocd i'm what, what's the word for what um there's a word for that not prone exempt exempt nice. that's a good word yeah that's the word i got smart books too i'm not i'm also not <laughs> exempt <laughs> from, from anything i experienced my own anxiety depression yeah yeah because just because that's what's interesting to me is that even even though you're like a like a practicing therapist with like a master's degree you still have like all the same stuff well, I feel like this is a good, a really good moment to normalize then that yeah, exactly. therapists are humans first. And I think there's this kind of general like societal view of therapists is like they're the monk on the mountain or like we imagine that like I'm climbing this mountain and there's this like monk up here and they're like telling me like they, they know like how to get to the top. They know all the tricks when really in reality, it looks more like you're on your mountain and I'm on my mountain and we're both climbing it different points but i can look over at your mountain and say like hey i think your pant leg is stuck on a rock i can see that from here oh no when my pant leg got stuck on a rock i had to like you know use this one tool and do this thing but i'm still on my own mountain dealing with my own crap i got a saber tooth tiger come around the corner oh no it doesn't even exist anymore they do on your mountain i don't know what that was <laughs> <Saber -tooth laughs> Tigers. that's the first animal you thought I've of never seen one of those that's awesome <laughs> Is that in the book too? I'm pretty sure Are you like an eight-year-old boy? <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Saber to a tiger. Past life. Wow. Yeah. So. But that's great though. You're right though, because I don't know. We I would think like, oh, you have it all figured out. And you're like, no, still, still. Well, also as being my partner, and my man. Yup. My hot buff guy. Yep, buff is the you, perfect You know for firsthand that I got all sorts of issues. No. All sorts of very normal no. human issues. No, you're perfect. You don't have issues. I get bad gas. <laughs> well, I'm other than intolerant. <laughs> Wait, we're talking about mental health. Wait. We can talk about farting on a different one. We can talk, we can talk farting. We can okay. always talk That's farting. That's the next segment. Well, that was the first thing you said before you came, came on here, before you started. You were like, what if, I, what if I have to fart? I really do. I've been holding in this whole time. No, you haven't been. I'm just, it's a bead of sweat. It's just slowly. I always, I just said, you let, I just said, let it rip. Because, I mean, at this point, if you're going to be, because you'll be in this room with us for a, a, a plenty of time, so you can't just be holding in farts the whole time. That's unhealthy. Well, I want to be respectful of Mike. No. Let him get to know me a little bit better before I start stinking up the. Studio. Or that's like a power move, though. Or you could just run in and be like, hey, nice to see you. Let's go. Because that kind it of would be a boss dominance. move. It would throw me off my game for sure. I'd be like, <laughs> oh, wow, wow. You're just like a like, right. beautiful girl who's right smart talking about stuff, and you're like, hold on a second. You're like, Whoa, <laughs> she, she really has it all. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of having it all, though, I mean, you have to. I mean, this will probably be embarrassing for you, but you, I mean, we have to talk about the a certain thing you have OCD about. That's my favorite thing and the funniest thing it's to me. It's not that funny. We have to talk about it, though. We have to talk about it, and maybe I will. I'll start it to where I don't even know. You know, you should. Well, it's, it's about the <laughs> the ABC building. I don't even know how to start with this. I don't know. Well, basically, if, if you're driving, if, if you you don't live in LA, there's a certain freeway. I think it's like the 134. Again, people not in LA, it doesn't matter. It's a freeway. And you, when you live in LA, you pass by a lot of like uh, movie studios. It'll be like, you can see, oh, there's where CBS is or, oh, Universal. That's where the, you know, the NBC and when sound stage is. And when you're from not LA and like you, and you and pass you, and these you, things, you're like, whoa, that's, that's, that's it. That's it. That's Universal. It's that's like where the stuff is filmed. Yeah. And well, by the way, tell people you're from, you're from Florida. I'm from Florida. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't really, we'll get, I feel like people will get to know you more through these different segments because I feel like we didn't need to do a whole like, so Kaylee, tell us about where you're from, where <sighs> you grew up, what your, do you have any siblings? Like, I feel like we could just, yeah. we'll learn those things about you. Right. But, so you are, so from, for someone not from California, you see like, a, you know, the ABC building, you're like, wow, cool. More importantly though, is that you have s somehow developed some sort of, not laughing, uh, some <laughs> sort of, laughing. some sort of OCD about the building itself. Um, is that you can take it from here? Well, it was like one time we were just driving. I saw the ABC building and got really excited about it. And I said, Look, there, there's the ABC building. But you said and it you... like, you said it as if I like 
Hey, remember when we used to film the show there? <laughs> remember the sitcom we were on? Well, me, There's the ABC building. Me being from Florida, that's a cool thing to see the ABC building just out in the open. So I pointed out, you laughed. And then I think next time we drove past it, same thing. I like said it again. We laughed again. You're like, oh, it's the ABC building. Yeah, it's just making uh. a thing. But then <laughs> when you weren't in the car and I'm just alone by myself driving, I developed this interesting uh, harm obsession that if I don't say out loud, oh, there's the ABC building, then I will then get into a horrible car accident, like a, le- like a deadly car accident. And so every time I'm alone, out loud, I'll go, there's the ABC building, just in case. But the problem is, this is my favorite. Over the past few months, I've been doing this weekly get together with my girls, and we always carpool, and we drive past the ABC building. And for so long, I was just kind of learning about this new OCD like thing, and I didn't know how to explain it to them. So I would just kind of start saying it like off to the side <laughs> under my breath. And so you know, we'd all be talking about something, even the most inappropriate topics. Like someone would be talking about, you know, their dad is sick, and we're passing it, and I'm like, I have to say it. So I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah. There's the ABC building, and just under my breath. <laughs> and I it took me so long to explain it to them afterwards, but I've done it so many times with people now. But they didn't, and I but, can't stop. But they didn't when you said it. They didn't. No, they they weren't like, huh? You just were like, yeah, the ABC building. <laughs> and they just continued on because they didn't catch on at first. Mm-mm. But you were saying it. You had to say it out loud. Mm-hmm. You can't think it. Yeah. And then it got worse because I was thinking maybe I could just say it under my breath. They won't notice. But then a new, Here we go. OCD, obs- a new obsession came up saying it doesn't count if you don't say it loud enough for them to hear. They need to hear it for it to count. The other people in the car need to hear it. Yes. So you need to say it loud enough so that they hear you say, oh, look, there's oh. the ABC building, or else you're all going to get in a horrible car accident. Oh, they're in it too? And we're on the freeway, so I'm not taking any chances. That's what I'm talking it's about. It's high stakes, the uncertainty. Boom. The uncertainty. That's what I'm saying. It's all about the uncertainty. Because if you don't, if you think, maybe I won't do the ABC building, maybe I won't talk about it, is it worth it? No. Probably not. You don't want them to get into a horrible accident because you didn't talk about the ABC building out loud. There's the ABC building. Mm-hmm. But I think it, it really makes me it really just tickle slang in me just to be you with a car of people and you are like, yeah, well, I'm so sorry about your dad, the ABC building. I hope he can really <laughs> recover. Like, and, what, and, you, and you told them about it recently. I did though, right? recently have to tell which, them. I, which is really – but I wish, it, I wish that that stemmed from them going, huh? Yeah, well, that was What'd Scarlett. What'd you just say? Because we, I, I was in the car with Scarlett one time, just Scarlett the two is, of is us, a, one, my, of your, one of my close friends, very close friends. And this was a separate thing. I said it out loud. We, we were just talking, talking. I was telling a story. That's what was happening. I was telling her <laughs> this lengthy like story, and then right in the middle of it, I go, "Oh, there's the ABC building." And but I guess I said it in a really weird way. Like she said, I said it in an ominous way. <laughs> yeah, because like, if you don't, was like, there's the ABC building. And then I just kept going on, and she was like, "Okay, that's cool, but hey, can we?" Go back to the ABC building part. She's like, like, what was uh, that? Yeah. Or you? What? Yeah. And then so you finally had mm-hmm. to explain it. I explained it to her, and then she made me explain it to Ashoka, and then who's it? Who's, who's and then they convinced friend, me to comedian. tell my other friends, which led to a beautiful discussion and self disclosure on my other friend's part about her own journey with OCD. So, which is how you learned about the oven thing. Yep. And her pictures. So basically, the moral of the story is we all have our own OCDs. OCD tendencies, mm-hmm. um, but that one is specifically just really funny to me. Um, so what if you memorize like a hundred facts about that lot? So when you went by it, you could be like, there's the ABC building built in 1923. <laughs> there's the ABC building mm-hmm. first opened in 1940. Just, just become a tour guide. And, and maybe play it off. It would really be full yeah. circle. Yeah, but then uh, really in the middle of a story, like there's the ABC building. It was actually opened in 1925. <laughs> And also, yeah, did you guys know that you're like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> I was just talking about my dad. Right. Well, oh, I think you bring up a great point, though, Mike, of this this other idea of why OCD is so underdiagnosed is because people are really good at, like, hiding it or accommodating it in a way that people don't really notice or pick up on it. Yeah. So that could, if, you know, if I really was dedicated to, like, okay, well, I'm just going to keep up this compulsion, then... Maybe I would try to make it 
play try to play it off in some way and like for you it's like the fist bumps it's like yeah. this, this like socially acceptable kind of way to still give in to the OCD and then it goes undetected by other people yeah because they're like oh he's cool like oh he's a fist bump guy nice that's why that's why COVID was good for me outside of getting COVID and everything else that happened it was like oh now fist bumps are more accepted mm. now i can get away with doing this give it into the compulsion more howie mandel kind of blew the cover off all mm. that one because everyone was like oh yeah how he's doing the fist bump because he won't shake hands mm -hmm. and made that a known thing oh and people are mm -hmm. like oh you're a jerk like yeah which i mean you, but then you'll have people who will i don't love this how people will like they'll keep their hand out and like we've talked about that how people mm -hmm. like will like no i'm not gonna fist bump you like shake my hand and i'm like and then you're like okay but i and now i'm like i never give into that i'm like oh no i'm gonna stick with this like we're this weird rock paper scissors scissors? game <laughs> someone else runs up paper yeah. rock. that's what you do then you just throw him the scissors yeah if you're rock and he's like this you just go and walk away oh that'd be so dorky though what if it's like someone like really <laughs> cool <laughs> gotcha <laughs> bye it's the david Duque full house cut it out mm. hey see you at the abc building <laughs> But you also don't like, by the way, you, we, we can start to wrap this up, but you hate when people, when you like, cause you, you reframe that very nicely when people make me shake their hands, you're like, oh, but that's like people, you shouldn't have to touch people in certain ways if like you don't want to or whatever. Well, um, physical boundaries. Physical boundaries. You know, OCD or not, if you don't want to shake someone's hand. They don't, don't like leave it out there. To... Like here. I'm like, no, why do I, I don't want to touch your hand. Well, this, this, this conversation about accommodation leads me to another thought which leads me to the thought about the shoe tying lady which we will get into it's so funny you said that because i mentioned <gasps> that on the earlier segment that i want to i want to have a whole separate segment about that that i want to have you on for and do a whole breakdown of shoe gate that's what i'm going to start to call it <laughs> um and uh yes but continue i didn't mean to cut you off i just want to well, say i don't want to get into that if yet. we're talking about that another time then i don't know if but it's, it's the up, same idea of, but... of someone not respecting a physical boundary well, well more so it was along the lines of like let's say that let's say there's um a, a kid in therapy trying to work on contamination ocd or something and they can't touch a door handle without washing their hands or, or whatever and they're working on that in therapy doing exposure and it's it's going great when they go home their family is going to be accommodating these behaviors if they're not like working one-on-one -on -one with therapists. So it's like in therapy, they're facing their fears. They're really getting exposed to what makes them uncomfortable. But when they're at home, maybe mom is letting them use a paper towel to open the doorknob. Maybe mom is opening doors for them so they don't have to touch mm. it. So it's accommodation, which, as we know, strengthens the OCD, which reminds me of Shoegate. And how everyone, we can cut this part out if no, it's no, too okay, much, no. but how everyone in the comments was saying, oh, you're so mean. Like she had OCD. You should have let her tie your shoes. And that would have made her feel better. And the biggest problem with that is that if you did, that would have just strengthened the woman's OCD. And so a lot of people just didn't have a lot of knowledge of that. Yeah. You're right. But I don't want to talk about Shoegate if we're talking about I know. We'll do like, we'll, I want to do we like, a, I want to do part. like a deep dive into Shoegate and then we can really talk. But that that is, that is super related. So I'm glad we brought it up. Um, and I think to, I think to probably maybe wrap up on, unless there's any other OCD things you wanted to get to. Um, I think to kind of wrap it up is what advice would you give to people who are struggling with OCD in varying degrees on something very basic like mm -hmm. oh check on the stove or like so bad that you've like trouble you've like a hard time leaving the house because mm. they'll be even for me there'll be times like where i'll check something so much that i'm just like running now i'm like more late than i was before and it's it's really hard sometimes so what kind of advice would you give to people struggling with it i mean my biggest advice is like find support whether that's like friends like trusted people that you can talk to about this stuff and and work with a therapist specifically to like address certain obsessions or compulsions before they start really getting in the way of your well-being. Yeah. Um, Cause I mean, I feel like if you're going to work with like real OCD, then working with a therapist is going to be your best bet. Yeah. What about just uh, what about outside of just like basic day to day? Any like little things you can do? I like the whole thing of like let me not wash my hands for five minutes. Yeah, like, like those types of things. 
it's like you can do your own exposures, but it really works best when you're in like working with a professional who's yeah. there like because you need like check ins about your anxiety because during exposures, your anxiety is going to get to like a 10 out of 10 and it'll stay there for a little bit, but then it'll come back down. And so it's not recommended that you do these kinds of things alone. You can, but um, I would also say there's like lots of resources like on International OCD Foundation's website. There's lots of like people who make YouTube videos about like specific things you can try to do to like challenge your OCD. Um, but I'd rather people watch this on YouTube though, instead of looking at other videos, they can probably just watch this podcast and then, and then you know, go to well, go see a therapist, but you know, no other YouTube videos. I feel like this is the main one, right? We're not gatekeeping medical information though, so go okay. watch it. Go watch other people's podcasts. You're right. You're right. You're, you're right. right. You're right. I'm being I selfish. I can't believe you made it this far. In what way? I'm talking to the the viewers. <laughs> They're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> They're talking about me just just in life. Can we admit this no, far? I'm just well, that's the episode. Um, thanks to Kaylee for being here. Bringing the OCD topics, I learned a lot. I thought that was really interesting. Um, thanks to Mike for producing, and thanks, Mike. um. We'll be back next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. We'll see you guys. uh, See you soon.